Uh, very good evening to all of you. I welcome you all to the first uh, academic session of Neurology SIG. Uh, because of our study here, we brought out the webinar the last Wednesday. And today we have got uh, uh, two brief talks and uh, three case presentations. I would request our President Dr. Chapali Bulati, ma'am, to introduce the speakers for today, the moderator and the expert for today's session. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you. Um, after a wonderful conference we have had from 8th to 10th in CMC Valor, uh, where we had 620 participants in the main conference and over 400 in the workshops, here we come back with the SIG series. And I must say that uh, till pre-conference, we have had uh, on all the sessions around uh, 45 countries attendees had participated. So we are very, very uh, grateful to you for your support. And I encourage that participants from various other countries can also, um, you know, uh, contact us and uh, present cases. Asmita, can I have the CV slides, please? Today, uh, we bring the neuroimmunology session series in which we'll have two talks. First, we'll be on the neuroimaging by Professor Atin Kumar, who's a dear colleague and friend, a professor of radiology from All India Institute of Medical New Sciences, um, New Delhi. And um, we have been doing neuroradiology every weekly sessions for so many number of years. And he has uh, numerous articles and a uh, lot of uh, orations and a lot of awards. And uh, uh, you know, every week we have a neuro radio meet uh, for so many years now. And then uh, we have Dr. Viral Avadwai, who is a doctorate degree in microbiology from PD Hinduja Hospital with a management degree in IM Calcutta, has been trained for neurology, immunodiagnostics from Euroimmune Germany, having a total 12 years experience uh, in SRL diagnostics in Mumbai. And, and, and we are, he'll be having 18 international publications, we'll be speaking on the diagnostics. After that, we will be having uh, three cases. And uh, the experts for today are, the, uh, we have Professor Hassan, who uh, is a pediatric neurologist and epileptologist and heading the Child Neurology Society in Turkey and a very well-acclaimed pediatric neurologist. And we have, besides Professor Hassan, Dr. Anita Mahadevan, who's professor and head of Department of Neuropathology, Nimans, Bangalore. And we have been collaborating with her for a long, long time on all these autoimmune uh, tests. And uh, she has over 200 publications and very well acclaimed. And Dr. Arijit Chattajarji is a very senior pediatric neurologist uh, in Kolkata. So Kolkata, pediatric neurology and Dr. Arijit are synonymous. And uh, to moderate the sessions, we have Dr. Mini, a dear colleague and friend from uh, Government Medical College, Trivandrum. And I now hope hand over to Dr. Mini. And after the two talks, then the cases, I request the case presenters to stick to time of six plus two. And Dr. Mini will remind them at five minutes that the five minutes are over. Now, over to you, Dr. Mini. I think without much delay, we will start the first session now. Uh, Professor Atin Kumar will be uh, discussing the first session. Sir, over to you. Yeah. So good evening, Dr. Atin. Before you, Dr. Atin, before you speak, I, I also welcome Dr. Udani, who is the patron of this SIG and other experts from SIG. Uh, thank you, Dr. Udani, for joining. And sorry, Dr. Atin, now please take on. No good evening, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank AOCN and uh, Professor Shifali Gulati, ma'am, for giving me this opportunity to talk. So the topic which has been given to me uh, is acquired demyelination, imaging clues to diagnosis. <clears throat> I have specifically kept it like only radiology and only imaging, and I will be discussing what all we need to see when we are talking or, or thinking in terms of a, it could be a query, a demyelinating event. And how does radiology play a role in making a, first a diagnosis of demyelination? And then secondly, classifying it to various causes of acquired demyelination in pediatric, um, in pediatric patients. So we all know acquired demyelinating syndromes. I think we all know pretty well they are basically immune system dysregulation triggered by an infectious or another environmental agent in a genetically susceptible host. And there are a total multiple uh, syndromes which have been described. Basically, monophasic versus recurrent, we all know that uh, if it is with encephalopathy, it's often ADEM, or without encephalopathy, it is 
CIS, but if it goes to a recurrent relapsing type of a syndrome, then we have to think in terms of a neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorder or multiple sclerosis or the newly described entity, which is also now 8 to 10 years old, the MOG associated antibody associated disorder. But when whenever a call comes to us for imaging of the brain or the spine or the optic nerve, these are the three main areas which are often involved in these uh, demyelinating syndromes, then as a radiologist, we just need to first confirm whether there is a, any demyelinating lesion present in these areas and then we need to characterize. So let's look at one by one all of these lesions. When we talk about brain, we typically do a T1, T2 flare diffusion and when you're specifically looking for demyelinating lesions, we often like to give contrast also. When in brain, how does demyelinating lesions appear? They are classically multifocal, bilateral, asymmetrical, often asymmetrical, predominantly white matter lesions. So if you see predominantly white matter lesions, bilateral, asymmetrical, multifocal, both supratentorial or infratentorial, always keep demyelination as a good possibility. Although it is just one of the differentials, other differentials could be, could be multifocal ischemia, they could be just areas of edema, they could be underlying vasculitis. However, in the clinical setting where clinically a demyelinating event is suspected, these are highly suggestive of a demyelinating lesions. You can have a more specific tone to this when you have a specifically periventricular lesions which are way more well-defined and oriented perpendicular that also is more specific favoring a demyelination. If you have lesions which are involving the uh, white matter in the internal capsule, a large lesions along with other patchy white matter lesions, again bilateral, again you should think in terms of it could be a demyelinating lesion. If you have infratentorial lesions also, especially involving the brainstem or the cerebellar peduncles, always think in terms of this could be a demyelinating lesion or if you have lesions which are involving the cortex or the just the subcortical juxtacortical area or the subcortical white matter again demyelinating needs to be a good possibility pure cortical involvement can also be theoretically seen in demyelinating events but then that needs to be correlated with the clinical scenario in those cases, there are other set of differentials which come into the picture. But if a combination of cortical as well as juxtacortical or subcortical white matter lesions are seen, then demyelinating needs to be a possibility. Besides these patterns, demyelinating lesions can also affect the deep gray matter. So if you have bilateral basal ganglia or thalamic involvement, often in combination with other white matter lesions, yes, demyelinating is a strong possibility. But in isolation also, Especially if it is asymmetrical bilaterally, demyelinating lesions should be kept as a possibility. Let's look at other scenarios. If they're not, if they're not multifocal or multiple or bilateral, if but even if there is one large lesion which is predominantly subcortical, in this case there are two large lesions, but again a predominantly subcortical lesion, a lesion which does not exert a significant mass effect or what. If, if this was a tumor, if this was an acute infarct, this would have led on to a significant mass effect. So if the mass effect is disproportionately less compared to what is expected by the size of the lesion, then demyelinating lesion is one good possibility which should always be kept. Another area, if there is specifically involvement of the middle cerebellar peduncle and a large lesion, always think in terms of a demyelinating lesion. If you see something like a tumor again but with almost no mass effect or a very minimal mass effect and a lesion which is extending to the subcortical white matter and maybe has some graded areas peripheral areas are appearing slightly uh, less bright on t2 weighted images central area appearing brighter on t2 weighted images so this also should favor a demyelinating lesion and in this specific case more like a tumefactive demyelinating type of a lesion and again, so I've told you, if you have specifically periventricular lesions, but now if you do a T1 weighted image and some of the lesions appear like what is classically described as black holes, they appear absolutely dark on T2, well-defined, demarcated. So if you see black holes, that also favors a demyelinating lesion. However, having said that, 
it's not just specific for demyelinating, but in this context, this combination together should think in terms of a demyelinating and more specifically, a multiple sclerosis. These were on the T1 and the T2 weighted images. If you give contrast, then if you see some of the lesions can enhance, not all the lesions can show enhance, but some of the lesions can show enhancement. If you see specifically an open ring or a linear or an arc type of enhancement, this type of enhancement should definitely be thought of as a demyelinating lesion. This is another example. This was the same demyelinating large tumefective plaque which I had shown you. Again, if you see, there is enhancement in an open ring manner. This is not a complete ring here, but an open ring here. Seeing this pattern, you should always think in terms of a demyelinating lesion. Then moving on to spinal cord, we all know myelitis is another classical feature often seen with demyelinating classical pathology, especially seen in the pediatric age group. If you see a long segment, T2 hyper intense signal change in the cord, which we classically described as a longitudinally extensive transverse myelitis. So LETM, which basically, basically means signal change a contiguous signal change involving more than three vertebral body segments of the cord. It is classified as LETM and this should, in if you see this, demyelinating should be one of the very strong possibilities besides other etiologies being either just pure viral myelitis or acute flaccid myelitis or even sometimes in ischemia or tumors also you can see, but in the acute event, demyelinating should be thought of as a possibility. If you also have a distinct pattern rather than a LETM, you have short segment lesions, which are less than three segment of vertebral body, but patchy multifocal small pattern lesions. This is also a pattern of demyelination. This is way more specifically seen in multiple sclerosis. But this again, when you see this, you have to think in terms of a demyelinating lesion. If you give contrast like this, in this case, if you give contrast, a tumors usually will show a well-defined, more homogeneous or nodular type of enhancement or large enhancement. But if you see a fluffy, irregular, patchy type of enhancement, only in some part of the entire spinal cord signal change, then this also favors a demyelinating lesion. So a combination of these, not all of them together, but even one of them or a combination becomes more specific for thinking in terms of a demyelination. When we are evaluating optic neuritis, which is again a very common clinical uh, scenario or a presentation in the demyelinating events, then you evaluate it by doing specific thin sections for evaluation of optic nerve in the plane of optic nerve. We tailor our sections in the plane of optic nerve. We typically do a fat saturated T2 weighted images in the axial plane, in the coronal plane, and we also like to give contrast. Hyper intensity in one of the nerve, like you see in this case, this is what is the normal nerve, and this nerve on the left side is showing a hyper intensity. This is a radiological marker for an optic neuritis. On the coronal image, this is a separate patient. You see both optic nerves appearing bright and hyper intense. So there is bilateral optic neuritis in this particular case. When you give contrast, you can see that the nerve typically shows enhancement. This one is not enhancing. This one is showing enhancement. It is bright on the post-contrast T1-weighted image. So this is another feature of optic neuritis. Sometimes you see both hyperintensity on T2 and enhancement on contrast, but sometimes you may not be able to appreciate the hyperintensity. You can only appreciate enhancement on contrast. Therefore, for optic neuritis, we need to give contrast for sure at least to confirm the diagnosis of optic neuritis. And this is, a, this is the same patient as this. The coronal images show both the optic nerves in a cross section are showing enhancement. And this is classically seen as optic neuritis, which is a marker for demyelination. So having said this, these are what we want to look at. Then based on the combination patterns and the specific differences between the types, we can try and see which type of demyelination does it happen. So classically, the lesions of ADM, especially when it is the first episode, the lesions of ADM are typically bilateral, large, fluffy type of lesions, not so well defined, more extending to the subcortical white matter, typically asymmetrical in origin and without any significant mass effect. These type of lesions are very classically seen on in ADM. This is, these are the flare axial images. These are the T2 axial images. The same patient, same sections, the T2 and the flare. As you can appreciate, the flare shows them slightly better. 
but large lesions, ill-defined margins without significant mass effect extending to the subcortical white matter, quite specific or quite likely to represent ADEM. Having said that, ADM also can involve the deep gray matter as well as the cortical gray matter also. Deep gray matter, it is involvement of the basal ganglia and the thalamus. Let's look at another patient. So in this case, there are bilateral asymmetrical patchy flare hyperintense lesions. These are the flare axial images involving again the subcortical white matter. In this case, it is also involving some areas of cortical gray matter. Again, bilateral, some involvement of the thalamus also and some involvement of the temporal lobe also. This was also in the acute presentation, patient presenting with encephalopathy. In the first episode, this was a classical ADEM. Some of these lesions actually were erstwhile just labeled as ADEM when we did not have the knowledge or the facility to diagnose MOGAD. But we now know, actually, when we do MOG, um, many of these can actually have MOG antibodies positive, especially in the pediatric age group. And it could be a MOG ADEM type of a group. And this was one of those actually MOG ADEM pattern. On giving appropriate treatment, on a follow-up, almost all of these lesions show a near total complete resolution. That's the hallmark for ADEM also. Most of the lesions can actually show a good resolution. In contrast, if you have very small focal patchy lesions, which are way more present in the periventricular location, small size, way more... Uh, well-defined, demarcated, very small side, uh, slightly more brighter on T2-weighted images. Some of them actually showing, as I had told earlier, about black holes. They are appearing absolutely dark on the T1-weighted images, especially oriented close to the periculosal surface. So in this case, you can see a lesion in the lower margin of the corpus callosum, which is the callososeptal interface. If you see these lesions, these are way more specific for multiple sclerosis. Another patient, you have lesions, again, which I had shown you in the previous patient also, largely periventricular lesions, more well-defined, demarcated, small lesions, periventricular in location, callososeptal interface, but you also see the orientation of the lesions. These are oriented perpendicular to the surface of the corpus callosum in a manner in a, along the perivenular space, and they are known as the Dawson's fingers. When you see a combination of this pattern, this is quite specific for multiple sclerosis. Again, in this patient also, you had we had black holes. All these features may not be present in every patient. Multiple sclerosis can also have lesions which are juxtacortical. We all know because we are there are four uh, areas which are required: juxtacortical, periventricular. There can be infratentorial lesion or there can be involvement of the spinal cord. Two of these actually together form constitute the dissemination in space criteria of the McDonald's. In this case, we also had a lesion in the brainstem. So a combination of these more specifically points toward multiple sclerosis. In NMO spectrum disorder, you have lesions in the brain parenchyma, which are because of the antibody against equaporin channels. So we all know the distribution of equaporin channels. They are along the periependymal lesions, the periventricular lesions most classically. So if you see lesions in the peri ependymal or close to the ventricular surfaces in the supratentorial compartment, even lesions along and adjacent to the fourth ventricle or even adjacent to the aqueduct. These are the classical areas which are involved in NMO spectrum disorder. Besides that, you can still have lesions in the subcortical white matter also or in the centrum semioveal also. So those areas also do have some aquaporin channels and more specifically, an area of which is the involvement of the area prostrema in the brainstem. They can also be seen with NMO spectrum disorder. If there are large lesions in the centrum semioval, often these lesions actually extend along the corticospinal tracts and go into the internal capsule. As you can see in this case, there is a large lesion here which is going along the corticospinal tract, extending into the internal capsule. This type of a lesion is more commonly seen in NMO spectrum disorder. And by seeing this type of lesions, you can be more specific in labeling it as or likely NMO spectrum disorder. Another patient, in this case, we can see a, a lesion in the area prostrema, which is the dorsal medulla, just above the level of the uh, medullary hump here, actually. So if you see this, again, this can be seen with other disorders, can be seen in multiple sclerosis also, but this is way more specifically seen with NMO spectrum disorder. If you talk about MOGAD, MOGAD has bilateral asymmetrical large lesions in the brain parenchyma, 
these are way more fluffy these are way more larger they can often involve the deep gray matter bilateral basal ganglia also involve the infratentorial compartment in the infratentorial compartment the involvement of the middle cerebellar peduncle or the brachia pontis if it is seen it points towards a diagnosis of morgaid so even if it was associated with encephalopathy would look like a adem if there's a lesion in the middle cerebellar peduncle, it's more likely that MOG antibodies will likely to be positive. Again, if there are lesions in the basal ganglia, again, there is very high chance that MOG antibodies will be positive, especially when we are talking in terms of a demyelinating lesion. If you have, again, cortical involvement and if you give contrast and you have patchy, fluffy type of enhancement, this also slightly favors a MOG-associated antibody disorder type of a pattern. Again, this is one another lesion which I've showed you large lesions in the infratentorial compartment involving the middle cerebellar peduncle, more specifically seen in MOG associated disorder. So this is one good diagram I've taken from one of the articles in radiographics. These are the classical findings for multiple sclerosis. These are the classical areas which get involved in the NMO spectrum disorder. I've already described them with along with the lesion in the internal capsule. And these are the areas typically which are associated and involved in the MOG antibody associated disorder, which I've already described. When we come to spinal cord involvement, if it is a LETN, then it is usually seen with either NMO spectrum disorder or MOG antibody associated disease, very less commonly seen with multiple sclerosis. Although it may be seen, we have seen cases proven in which there is LETN, but uh, more specifically seen with either NMO or MOG as, uh, antibody associated disease. In NMO spectrum disorder as well as MOG, it is when you do a cross-sectional imaging, it is usually the central area of the cord which is typically involved as you can see in this particular case. And if you give contrast and if there is patchy enhancement, which I've told you earlier that it is a marker for demyelination, enhancement is way more commonly seen with NMO spectrum disorder than other associated disorders. They can be patchily seen with MS also, but commonly seen with NMO spectrum disorder. If, if you have patchy involvement of the lesions with short segment involvement, not LEDM, then we have to think in terms of a multiple sclerosis. When you do cross-sectional imaging, most of these lesions either, are either eccentrically placed like in this part of the cord, it is on the right side. In this part of the cord, it is on the left side. And in this part of the cord, it is the posterior part which is involved. This is way more commonly seen with multiple sclerosis. And with this pattern, we can be more specifically calling it multiple sclerosis. Another example, again, patchy white matter lesions in the cord. In the lumbar or conus, it is posterior central or the right side. In the cervical cord, it was again on the right side at one point and in the lower part it was in the posterior problem. So a combination of this together call it multiple sclerosis. What's the difference between LETM of MOGAD and LETM of NMO spectrum disorder? If you see skip areas of LETM, so there is one LETM but then there is a normal appearing cord and then another LETM or if the LETM is extending to involve the conus then start thinking in terms of MOG antibody associated disorder. It favors MOG. If you see a H type of a pattern, which is the central gray area of the cord which is involved on the axial contrast images, then again think in terms more specifically for a MOG antibody associated disorder. If there is a central canal which is slightly prominent and dilated, again think in terms of a MOG antibody associated disorder. These are pointers not specific, but they favor one over the other. So this is just a conclusion for the same patchy areas, eccentrically placed multiple sclerosis, LETM, both can be seen with NMO or MOG. Conus involvement is more commonly seen with MOG. Both of them have a central area of involvement. Skip lesions in MOG, enhancement in NMO spectrum disorder and H pattern with MOG disorder. When we talk about optic neuritis, if it is a unilateral, simple, short segment optic neuritis can be seen in any of those three disorders which I have been described. However, commonly seen with multiple sclerosis. But if you see a long segment involvement of optic nerve, this is contrast enhanced, which is extending posteriorly and reaching up to the optic chiasma. So specifically, if there is involvement of the optic chiasma or even, even posterior to it, if there is involvement of the optic tracts, it definitely is way more specifically seen with NMO spectrum disorder. So by just seeing this pattern of a posterior involvement, you can favor an NMO spectrum disorder. But if you see 
more anterior involvement and the involvement which stops before the optic chiasma and there is inflammation which is extending beyond the optic nerve into the optic sheath also as well as into the periorbital fat. So if there is perioptic neuritis also like say in this particular case then this favors a MOG antibody associated disorder optic neuritis. So if there is perineuritis or anterior segment neuritis often bilateral it favors a MOG antibody associated disorder. So this is again a sum up short segment actually can be seen with all but more specifically seen with multiple sclerosis. Involvement of chiasma and optic tract favors an MO spectrum disorder. Anterior involvement with perineuritis favors a MOG antibody associated disorder. And this is just a sum up of NMO. So brain, spinal cord, as well as optic nerve. MOG, brain, central, inferior, conus, as well as central, and perioptic neuritis. Whereas multiple sclerosis, Patchy, patchy lesions also in the brain, periventricular or juxtacortical or infratentorial, patchy lesions in the cord, eccentric, and patchy lesion in the optic neuritis. So this is how you try and differentiate between these three relapsing type of uh, disorders. Thank you so much for this patient. Thank you, sir. That was a wonderful session. Now we will open uh, the session and uh, I invite comments from the Professor Hassan. Sir? Professor Hassan? Hi. Hi, uh, Dr. Mini. Hmm. You are inviting me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. For your expert <clears throat> comments. Yeah. Dr. Ajin Kumar, thank you very much. Uh, uh, your excellent presentation. I really enjoyed that. The, the final schematic presentation and then you clearly mentioned the diagnostic clues for uh, differential diagnosis between the acute uh, dominating disorders. Um, um, uh, my question about that, uh, using the uh, neuroradiologic imaging, we extensively use magnetic resonance imaging. My question about the uh, uh, tractography, diffusion tensor imaging, can we use in future these modalities for also definition of the acute demyelinating disorders? Sometimes we we would like to make a topographic description. Uh, and the second question is, uh, can we uh, can we define the uh, lesion burden uh, easily with the MRI um, for each patient? Sometimes we need a uh, lesion burden uh, to make a definition for making a treatment decision, uh, especially in the multiple sclerosis cases. Thank you so much. Right, sir. Thank you so much for your uh, appreciation. Uh, and, and thanks for those questions. Those were actually uh, nice questions. Uh, so talking about the first question, the role of diffusion tensor imaging. Yeah, it's it's a it's an advanced technique which has been available to us as a neuroradiologist. For many years now, it basically depends upon uh, using six different, at least six different directions of diffusion restriction and making a vector. So it just does not give us that there is diffusion restriction. It also tells us along which direction there is diffusion restriction. Based on these physical principles, when we apply this along the white matter tract, since most of these disorders actually predominantly involve the white matters, when we use it along the white matter tracts, we can uh, see what, whether there is a microscopic level of involvement also. So sometimes if to the naked eye, there is not clear involvement of or, or subtle signal changes on the T2 or the flare images, if you run the diffusion tractography sequences or the DTI sequences, by doing the quantification parameters, you have multiple parameters, the fractional and isotropic values, by measuring them, you can know whether these white matter tracts are actually showing microscopic level of involvement or not. And based on the extent of the tracts involved, you can also tell the extent of the burden of the disease which is present specifically. So this DTI has multiple other roles also in tumors to look for white matter tract, uh, either involvement or, or uh, displacement, but specifically for 
demyelinating lesions, it is more for a microscopic evaluation, which is not better seen on the naked eye and it definitely plays a role. And in terms of the lesion quantification uh, or the lesion load, yes, there are multiple uh, techniques which are available for doing quantification. We can use T2, heavily T2 weighted images. We can use uh, T2 relaxometry to do a quantification. There are professional softwares available to actually measure the volume and the size of each demyelinating plaque. So especially when you are doing a serial imaging, you want to see which all plaques actually resolve any new plaques which appear. So you want to compare one to the other. To a naked eye, sometimes those things become difficult. But when you're using the softwares or special techniques, you can actually measure the lesion load and increase. Uh, and you can even correlate with the extent of the clinical uh, residual uh, problems with the patient will persist based on the patient load, actually. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We move on to now the second expert. Uh, One second, yeah. Dr. Mini. The question answers can be uh, because their yeah, yeah. topics are not related. Question. Yeah, there are lots of questions which are there. Yeah. 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 One question was uh, that uh, does the lesion having true diffusion restriction give us any additional information in connection with the diffusion tensor imaging? Can we take up that question first? No, ma'am. So, yeah. So, so true diffusion restriction actually just means that there is cytotoxic edema. Even intramyelinic edema can actually give diffusion restriction, but it does not specifically tells us whether this is infarct or this is demyelinating or this is tumor. It just tells us that there is a uh, increased compared to cytoplasmic ratio or there is uh, increased cytoxic edema so that there is no space for the free water molecules to have a uh, random distribution of, uh, of diffusion so what it leads to is diffusion restriction. It can be seen with acu any acute pathology. Even abscess gives diffusion restriction. Even acute infarct gives diffusion restriction. Uh, High-grade tumor with high nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio will also give diffusion restriction. So can an acute demyelinating plaque can give diffusion restriction because of the acute demyelination which is happening. So that does not specifically labels it as a demyelinating thing. It just tells that there is cytotoxic edema, intracytoplasmic lesion, and which is kind of kind of acute. One more question is, uh, why is it that the ring is uh, uh, open or incomplete and towards the periphery or towards the cortex, whereas in case of abscess, it is towards the center? So ma'am, that, that basically because the demyelinating lesion will always have one area of acute demyelination, which is progressing in one direction. I do not know the exact reason why is it open on the cortical side, but for the abscess, it has actually got a tendency because that's because based on the vascular supply, the vascular supply is more from a sentry petal type of a pattern. So wherever there is the least vascular supply for an abscess, that will be the area which will show the weakest wall, which will not form and it will be the weakest wall, which can rupture on that side. So that's the reason for abscess to have on the ventricular side. But for a plaque, I do not know the exact reason, but I think it's related to the area of the spread of the myelination, which is uh, uh, more spreading towards the uh, deep white matter side uh, from the cortical fibers because of the, I think, the orientation of the exons. That, that's the reason. I think. So there's one more question on how to differentiate between press, posterior reversible uh, encephalopathy and also mitochondrial disease and, uh, uh, and encephalitis. Radiologically, how to differentiate these from demyelination? I think so, ma'am, already summarized uh, most of the things, but once more, right, ma'am. So, 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 any encephalitis typically has more of a gray matter involvement, right? Demyelination typically will have more of a white matter involvement. When we are seeing a white matter lesion, if it is predominantly in the posterior circulation, if it is predominantly uh, subcortical and without any mass effect. That could represent press or it could represent demyelination. In the current, in the clinical setting, when there is especially settings for press, press occurs with specific settings, raised blood pressure, chemotherapy, or nephrotic syndrome, all those scenarios you have to think in terms of a press. Demyelinating things does remain a differential. But if there are, of course, uh, uh, other areas involved, which are infratentorial, although, although actually press also often involves infratentorial, it's more like a clinical scenario correlation when you can differentiate, but otherwise both are uh, close differentials. Press, yes, will not show uh, contrast enhancement, 
whereas press can show patchy areas of hemorrhage press can be hemorrhagic most often demyelinating lesions are not hemorrhagic in fact it is said that if you see hemorrhage in a lesion or multiple areas of hemorrhage we have to think against demyelination with only exceptions being the acute hemorrhagic leukoencephalitis or the hurst disease which is a very rare type of a pattern besides that most other uh, pathologies multiple sclerosis nmo spectrum disorder adem the normal routine adem they will not show hemorrhage so if you see hemorrhage you actually rule out more or less you rule out uh, demyelination but otherwise yes we'll need to keep it as a differential and first of all look at the blood pressure of the patient that usually gives clues to press thank you dr atin for an amazing talk can you answer other queries in the q and a and at the end when we have time we will be able to answer i mean answer more in that and i think uh, dr uh, arijit and dr urani would you like to add something before we go and uh, dr atin meanwhile if you answer online uh, you know and then in the end you know because we'll have cases in that time we can answer the rest what is pending uh, sure, also sure. Uh, I'll do yeah, that. also live yeah also live yeah darijit you want to say something arijit uh, yeah, arijit I... there are two Hello. questions also whether you have seen uh, erythema nodosum with the demyelination and uh, uh, how common is pediatric edema so if you could take those questions also along with this that be So, ma'am, you're asking me, erythema nodosum, ma'am, I will not know, maybe the clinicians, Dr. Shafali, Dr. Bishwaru, you can no, tell. I'm asking Arijit, sir. Achha, oh, sorry. Sorry, ma'am. Yeah, sorry. What was the question again? I can't see the question. Say that again. Whether demyelinating disorders were present with erythema nodosum and also uh, uh, how common is uh, MS in pediatric age group? I, I wouldn't know the answer to the first question. Uh, sorry, I don't have any experience of seeing uh, the two together. And of course, pediatric MS is quite rare. Um, we, in practice, I wouldn't be able to tell you the incidence, but in practice, uh, in my practice, I, I rarely see a, more than a couple of cases in a whole year. Um, some of them uh, do present as CIS, but actually... Uh, working them up and to prove the MS uh, does take uh, time and sometimes the patient doesn't follow up with you. So overall, I would say the incidence is uh, very rare in pediatric population. But more so in adolescents, yes, uh, I, I have seen more cases in adolescents past the age of, let's say, 12 to 19 years. Danny, sir? No, the, I just wanted to make a uh, ask a question actually. That uh, yeah, is it? Uh, I mean, when you see a case of MS over time, serial imaging is very important in confirming the diagnosis because you see black holes coming up or you see. So how? I mean, is it ever the case that once you have the first couple of attacks of MS, do the lesions ever disappear? Right, sir. Uh, good question. Yes, in, in, in our experience, we have seen lesions actually resolving, not completely maybe disappearing, but significantly reducing in size. Not all MS lesions are small lesions. We have seen proven patients of MS with slightly larger lesions also, but with, given uh, the steroids, many of these lesions actually show a significant resolution and very minimal small residual lesions do remain. And we've seen that in our practice. Naveen uh, wants to say something. And Naveen, your hand was raised. Even Dr. Anita's was raised and Taj also. All three in sequence can just uh, say what they wanted to say. Naveen, please. Uh, just a small point regarding MS incidence. So uh, what we have seen is Western Hemisphere versus India. The incidence is one-tenth or even less. So it is. this is in adults. So pediatric MS will be even less. So it's not surprising that we don't see MS either uh, in practice uh, or in various series that uh, are published, incidence of MS is actually very, very less in India and Southeast Asia. That's all. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Dr. Anita, you had your hand raised uh, some time back and Taj as well. It, it's just a curious question. It was an excellent talk. Really enjoyed it. You must be wondering why a pathologist is asking. Uh, I was I'm asking because radiologists seem to have answers all the time. 
So the question is, you showed very beautifully the difference in distribution of the lesions in NMO versus MOG in the optic nerve spinal cord. Is there any biological reason for that distribution? <clears throat> mm, I, I do not know. I haven't actually gone into that depth to know, but I, I'm sorry, I do not know the difference. For, for optic nerve, I do not know. For NMO, of course, it is based on the areas where there, were, there are aquaporin receptors which are present. Yeah. I... Then, for the brain lesions. But for optic nerve specifically, extending uh, to involve the chiasma versus mm. just remaining anteriorly, I would not know the difference. Naveen has a hand raised. Naveen? Uh, nothing nothing much to add. I think primarily because there are two different diseases. One is primarily astrocytopathy and secondary demyelination, whereas MOG is primarily a demyelinating oligodendroglyopathy. So probably the distribution of the antigens and how it interacts with the body's autoimmunity decides the distribution of the lesions. But uh, the exact reason is probably not available even in literature. Thank you. Dr. Thaj, you had your hand raised some time back. No, ma'am. I'm okay, ma'am. I'm okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mini, we can so go to the next. Uh, move on to the second session on role of lab in neuroimmunology diagnostics. Uh, Dr. Virat, over to you. Is the screen visible? Yes. Oh, yes, sir. Sir has logged out, ma'am. I think she disconnected, yeah, for some reason. Smitha, can you call him and ask? Okay. Yeah, I'll find Me Meanwhile, Dr. Atin, what you were typing, you can, you know, your topic is very hot topic, so you can answer them live while the other speaker joins. Can I just ask a question to Dr. Atin? Yes, sir. Uh... Yes, ma'am, please. In um, cases of uh, MOGAD uh, and also in cases of uh, NMOSC, whenever there is a hyperacute presentation, one close differential diagnosis is ischemia to the cord also. So, and also uh, flaccid uh, myelitis due to viral infection. So, how do you differentiate uh, these? Whenever there is a spinal cord lesion, they are very small. And how do you make out this? Any clues? whether it is demyelination or whether it is ischemia or viral infection? Uh, right, ma'am. So a good question again and a difficult one too because we also face the same issues. What has been uh, described as uh, most of the features between the three actually overlap with each other. But if for especially for spinal cord ischemia, there are the best indicator is not more of a imaging but more of a clinical setting. There is usually either a post-operative status or a patient who has had a significant shock status to, especially in children when I'm talking about. Or of course, they occur way, the spinal cord ischemia occurs way more commonly in adults where there are atherosclerotic arteries and the spinal artery gets involved with an acute event. So the acute, spinal cord ischemia is an acute event in children. If you have these settings, one of these settings available, we have to think. It is usually, again, a long segment involvement. Could be patchy, but usually a long segment involvement, typically more involving the anterior horn cells. What helps us to differentiate is showing a diffusion restriction. This is one scenario where a diffusion of the spinal cord is described to be done. And if it shows a diffusion restriction, it significantly more favors a acute spinal cord ischemia vis-a-vis -vis 
the other disorders which typically do not show diffusion restriction, especially when I'm talking about spinal cord. On a cross section, the spinal cord ischemia is often involving usually the anterior horn cells, but, but it may be more central and we can have a, even an edge type of a pattern also having said that. And Thank sorry, you, your, uh, this was the question. I, yeah. Did I miss another Thank question? You. Oh. Thank you. Sir. Thank you, Dr. Atin. Meanwhile, you answer on, on I mean, by typing. Yeah, ma'am. I will. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Viral, please. Yeah. So, thank you for providing an opportunity to present. So, I will be presenting on the role of laboratory in neurological autoimmune diagnostics. So, you are basically, I'm just going to stick on whatever other diagnostic modalities available and how the labs are trying to be updated all the time to provide the latest uh, diagnostic modalities. So, in autoimmune neurology, the topics which we are expected to be discussed are the encephalitis, paraneoplastic, demyelination in terms of optic as well as peripheral, myositis, myosinia gravis, and other supportive testing like ANA or CSF IgG index. So, encephalitis, although discovered in around 30 years back, since till date, there are almost 35 antibodies which have been clinically proven to be relevant, and hence testing is very important. But getting tested for each and every of these antibodies standalone, it seems to be too expensive. So based on what methodologies are available to test for each of these antibodies, there are in total four methods which are available. One is the CBA, that is a cell-based assay. Second is the TBA, that is a tissue-based assay. Third is the routine IHC, wherein the biopsy is taken and sent to the laboratory for IHC staining. And fourth is the live neurons. So before we just enter into the sensitivity specificity for each of them, just to have a basic understanding for everybody, what is a CBA and a TBA? So cell-based assays are wherein uh, it's EK kind of cells are taken and a target region for say one particular antibody, example NMDA is been fused. A serum sample or a CSS sample has been overlaid on those cells. After post-incubation period, a secondary antibody which is color labeled has been incubated on it. If there are presence of any NMDA antibodies in the serum of the CSS sample, they give the respective fluorescence which are captured by a microscope. And depending on our uh, sensitivity or the fluorescence which has been observed, you can just give a semi-quantification whether it is a high titer or a low titer. Uh, next, in case of a TB, that is a tissue-based assay, we have the rodent and the primate cerebellum, hippocampus, nerve, and the intestinal tissues. Again, the principle is the same. The CSF or the serum samples have been overlaid. A secondary antibody has been conjugated. And then whatever is the pattern being observed under the microscope, for a cerebellum or a hippocampus, based on the pattern, you say uh, or probably uh, X antibody is being observed. So in this case, cerebellum, it is, uh, you can just see a few granular layers as well as molecular layers. So they show the operative staining as well as the hippocampal, which shows the complete negative staining. So based on this pattern, you say this X antibody, example NMD, could be positive or GAD65 could be positive. So uh, as you can see, the testing method is very crucial depending on the increasing number of antibodies which are now being proven to be clinically relevant. So in terms of sensitivity, when you compare the CBA versus the TB and the IHC, the CBA has, offers the highest sensitivity, also the highest specificity. But the only problem is it cannot detect unknown antibodies since they are targeted approach for a specific antibody. Secondly, they are currently available in the Indian market for surface or, uh, antibodies. And whereas the tissue-based antibodies have a high sensitivity, they can see the unknown antibodies or you can screen for unknown antibodies as well, depending on the pattern. And you can just conclude whether this antibody pattern can be labeled to a particular antibody, which is known, example, NMD or GAT65, or is totally unknown in the database. And hence, we say it is an unclassified antibody. So this is how you can screen for a large number of antibodies. And then finally, based on the pattern, you can go for a specific CBA test if available to confirm the uh, screening probability. The next IHC, which are, low in, uh, which are low in sensitivity and invasive because you need a biopsy. The specificity could be high, but it cannot detect the unknown antibodies. And live neurons are only used when you have a discordance in results between a CBA that is cell-based assay and a tissue-based assay. Finally, these are the antibodies which depending on the different kinds of clinical features are being observed but still if you see none of the antibodies have a clear cut correlation with any one particular clinical phenotype so in case whichever antibody you say you cannot say just by looking at a clinical condition which is the possible uh, antibody which is expected a probability is there but not any confirmation 
So if you can see, there are multiple antibodies which could be positive based on the number of multiple clinical symptoms. The blue indicates the rare antibodies as per the clinical symptom and the orange red indicates the most common which are there as per the clinical symptom. So we need an approach which can target the rare as well as the common antibodies. Similar thing has been highlighted in one of the texts wherein there are various reasons for a misdiagnosis of encephalitis. The first two I will not go into detail because it's a clinical part. The third, which is restricted to the laboratory, I'll be explaining that the use of, you can say the limited use of a brain tissue assay, the tissue-based assays, along with the cell-based assays, in, results in only narrow range of antigens which are being screened for, and hence it could lead to a misdiagnosis or a say false negative report. So hence, cell-based assay plus a tissue-based assay is the preferred testing. Proceeding to the next, the paraneoplastic syndromes. Of course, it is very rare in children, but still important. So uh, there are four categories which are there. The high-risk antibodies, the intermediate-risk antibodies, the lower-risk antibodies. And currently, the, those three antibodies which are being tested for, but they do not fall into any categorization as of now. Now, considering whatever the guidelines has been stated, this table has been taken up from that guideline. You still see that the red arrow marks are actually the antibodies which also overlap in the encephalitis panel also. So, looking at whatever the guidelines are stating, that it is necessary to investigate the serum and the CSF for determination of antibodies, especially in case of a surface antigens. Also, you should only consider the tests which are uh, detecting IgG-based tests, not IgM or IgA-based tests currently. Antibodies, if positive, especially the cell surface antigens, if positive in serum and but negative in CSF, should be rechecked or you can say if only tested by serum and if you say it's positive, it is necessary to confirm it on a CSF-based sample also. Also, whatever the uh, testing has been done using a commercial line blood assay or a cell-based assay, it is necessary to also confirm it by brain immunochemistry, uh, especially if serum is alone tested and if found to be lower in type. Finally, everything has to be correlated clinically and if any uh, discordance in the clinical correlation and the lab uh, reported test of a specific uh, expected lab should be referred to. So we'll just start off with these first four points. That is investigate serum and CSF samples at the same time. And for the other uh, fourth point wherein they say commercial line blots or the cell-based assays are to be confirmed by brain immunochemistry. For the commercial line blot assays, we'll come back in the later section of the paraneoplasty. So based on our experience for the encephalitis testing, we had one patient who was actually a case of ataxia but was not responding to any of the standard medicines. The, the clinician had not initiated on IVIG. Doctor had prescribed a serum autoimmune encephalitis panel just to rule out if there are any antibodies. To our surprise, the serum NMDA turned out to be positive by a cell-based assay. But since at our laboratory, we also do a tissue-based assay as simultaneously, the tissue-based assay did not reveal any pattern which was indicative of a NMDA. Hence, we screened the CSF sample for NMDA to confirm and resolve the query. Both the CSF cell-based assay and the tissue-based assays turned out to be negative. Hence, it was a confirmed negative. But the only thing which was good for us that we found out similar cases had been reported uh, in other parts of the country world, wherein a recent publication by Mayo Clinic uh, showed the exact similar patterns and it was seen that only CBA assays may be sometimes giving a false positive for NMD antibodies. And a tissue-based antibody or a paired testing of serum and CSF is uh, recommended. So this is why CSF and serum simultaneous co-testing is important. Uh, next, coming to those commercial line blood assays, which are currently used for paraneoplastic symptoms. So basically, there are two kits available. One is the immunoblot uh, testing and one is the tissue-based testing, which are available by only one monopolistic vendor. So we, the clinician needs to understand that when they are sending out these samples, what method should be considered uh, when, for the lab which is being tested for. Now, the, or as per the guidelines of paraneoplastic testing, a TBA that is based on the primate cerebellum, nerve, and the intestine tissue screens for known as well as the unknown antigens. In comparison to an immunoblot, an immunoblot detects only 11 antigens or in comparison to a tissue-based assay. Actually, an immunoblot uh, detects 12 antigens. The 12th one, which is marked here with the red arrow, is the recovering. This recovering antibody cannot be detected by a tissue-based assay using these three tissues as of now. Hence, if a clinician is suspecting anything like a uh, retinopathy, then tissue-based screening assay alone can lead to a false negative report. 
whereas all of the 11 antibodies, if they turn out to be positive or indicative on screening testing of tissue-based assay, has to be mindfully being confirmed by a second uh, methodology that is the uh, immunoblot assay before reporting it out as a confirmed positive. If the testing is done by only one method, then uh, it cannot be considered as a confirmed positive since a secondary method for confirmation is pending. Why is this so? Because false positive and false negative results are particularly high for line blood assays assessing these following antibodies. That is the Yo, Mar2, CV2 and the SOX1. Similarly, there are certain reports for ZIG4 false positive as well. So, what do we mean by here? If a laboratory is testing only by an immunoblot assay and if it reports positive for any of these antibodies, it may be a false positive. Hence, a confirmation by a tissue-based assay is important. So, ideally, as per the guidelines, a tissue-based assay as a first-line screening approach would be a better cost-effective strategy as well as screening for a known as well as unknown. If anything of known pattern has been observed and be further be tested for a uh, immunoblot assay to uh, get a confirmation for the antibody being uh, documented. But again, just to mind it, a uh, recovering antibody will not be covered up in a tissue-based assay. Uh, next, for the demyelination, we have two bifurcations. One is for the optic, wherein you have the AQP4 NMO as well as the MOG. Uh, more tighter testing has recently been recommended, which we'll go through. And the next, which is coming up, is the GFAP testing and the NFL testing. On the other hand, we have the peripheral, that is the GBS and the CIDP. Approximately 9% of causes are for childhood quality neuropathy because of these two conditions, that is the GBS and the CIDP. So when you go for demyelination, again, in this IgG-based testing is only recommended. IgM and IgA testing is not recommended. Uh, AQP4 IgG testing is recommended for all patients with clinical and clinical radiographical findings for NMO ASD AQP4 diagnosis. There are multiple methods which are available. Uh, the live CBA or well the fixed CBA, again, probably could be a method of choice based on the encephalitis experience, but this kit is currently not available in India. So the other options which are available are the ELISA, RIA or the IHC. RIA is less sensitive and specific, but can be used only if CBA is not available. So the current available method, which is being commonly used, are the ELISA for uh, sorry for for the it's the CBA which is there for the AQP4. So this is incorrect. It's the CBA method which is currently available for the AQP4. Uh, so the testing for demyelination optic AQP4 and MOP. So preferred sample type is serum. Uh, timing of the antibody testing should ideally be prior to treatment initiation and not after uh, treatment initiation because it could lead to a ne false negative results because of the resolution. Uh, tighter de uh, determination is recommended in AQP4 but not currently done. But whereas for mock IgG, it is very much important because low titers are known to be false positive which could be in the range of 1 is to 10 or less than 1 is to 100. This kind of transient positivity is more likely to be a monophasic cause. And treatment decisions are currently not based on any follow-up serology or titer. So again, this is up to a clinician, but of course, in, it is recommended that tighter testing is recommended for mock positivity. Uh, so demyelination in case of optic by GFAP and NFL. Uh, GFAP uh, testing is blood or a CSF marker a good testing for NMOST. Uh, basically, blood is the preferred sample type. ELISA is sensitive currently only in case of CSF, while it is showing inconsistent results for blood, that is serum. On the other hand, there is another digital ELISA by Simoa, which is the only platform available which is having high sensitivity and specificity comparable with CSF. So uh, this technology of digital ELISA can be used for both blood as well as the CSF testing. But currently, this test is also not available in India. Uh, the next is the serum uh, NFL testing. These levels are basically a topic of research interest showing promising results for NMOSD, but currently cannot be commented anything for their diagnostic use. Uh, then demyelination case of peripheral for the GBS, there are again two methodologies. One is the ELISA and one is the immunoblot. The antigen targets in ELISA for each IgM and IgG are in total 3 plus 3, that is 6. Whereas in case of immunoblots for IgM and IgG, they are total 7 plus 7. Uh, diagnostic in nature, the ELISA, high titers are specific, but low titers can also occur in other disease cases also. Whereas immunoblots are diagnostic in nature, positive is confirmed positive. And a preferred sample is a serum. There are certain reports of CSF-based testing, but no clinical relation or sensitive benefit has been documented for ganglioside testing by CS. 
demyelination by CIDP. This affects basically the peripheral nerves. And there are around five antibodies which are known to be causing these CIDP cases. That is the NF140, 155, 186, contactin 1 and Casper 1. Now, two methods which are currently available are the CVEA and the ELISA. CBA kits are not available commercially. Only ELISA is physical as of now, but there is no comparative data on CBA versus ELISA. Uh, serum is the preferred sample of choice. Uh, next, we'll go on to the myositis. There are two testing methodologies. One is the ANA by indirect immunofluorescence IF. And second is the immunoblot, that is the ADN antigen, which covers the MSA, MAA, and the NAF. Now, ANA IF, the current method which is being used across laboratories, that's doing a testing at a dilution of 1 is to 100, which is actually ideal for rheumatology cases. But this leads to false negatives when we are actually trying to screen for myositis antigens. The so ideal dilution is 1 is to 10, which is also documented in the urine kit insert. And hence, what is being considered as a gold standard ANIF is actually not a standard. So only if the title levels are very high, could possibly this give you a positive report, a screening positive report. But if actually which are low, this would be actually false negative. So immunoblot, a serum sample is recommended. It targets in total 18 autoantigens, which also includes now the CN1A and the HMGCR. HMGCR has been reported recently by an adolescent age group also. Hence, it is important to shift to an extended panel compared to a previous 16 antigen myositis panel. Uh, myasthenia gravis, again, uh, there are two, that is the ACHR and the MAS. Uh, LRP clinical utility is controversial with mixed reports showing a, with, in favor of myasthenia gravis and also against. Uh, Agrin is a new biomarker of interest. Uh, the sample which is recommended is serum. There are two methodologies, that is the CBA and the ELISA. Uh, CBA is expected to be more sensitive, but currently not available commercially in India. And hence, for both ACHI and MUSK, ELISA is the most common method used. The only point which needs to be taken into consideration that any testing will have a certain amount of percentage covariance. So if the values are just too close to the borderline, a clinician will also have to correlate strongly with his clinical uh, acumen to see whether actually it is a positive or a negative report. Because based on a repeat testing, very borderline patients may again go back into a negative or a positive. So, uh, finally, this is actually uh, just a supportive test in optimum, but I just thought to include because of a Weber diagram which is being used these days. So, CSF IgG index is basically a biochemical test to determine intrathecal IgG synthesis. It is often used in synergy with OCB, but it is important to pair the serum and the CSS samples together to get, obtain an accurate report. Ideally, the both specimens should not be collected more than one hour apart. This is because of the high turnover rate in CSS sample. Uh, nephrometry or immunoterbidometry is the preferred method of choice. And ideally, a Graeber diagram should always be provided with a CSF IgG index report. Because by the time our OCB report comes, or even if it is not prescribed by a clinician, it provides information on the blood barrier dysfunction. So what is the Raper diagram? Uh, this is a Raper diagram wherein the y-axis has the IgG and the uh, x-axis has the Q-albumin. Uh, specifically, the Q-albumin has been considered because it is there only in the liver. So that clearly it can be help in distinguishing a blood brain barrier dysfunction or no. So if you see this kind of a chart which is being provided in the CSF index report, if the uh, dot which lies in the portion one, that means this is absolutely a normal case and hence there is no IgG synthesis, no blood brain barrier dysfunction. If the point lies in zone two, that means there is a dysfunction of the blood brain barrier, but there is no immunoglobulin production. Whereas in three, it indicates, yes, there is a blood brain barrier dysfunction and also there is additional immunoglobulin production. In case of four, the brain barrier uh, is intact, but yes, the immunoglobulin production is there in the CNS. And five, it also indicates whether there are any analytical errors in the processing by a laboratory. So this also helps as a check for the laboratory also whether there are any uh, missteps which are being done on. Similarly, Weber diagrams for IgA, IgM, and IgG, the other two immunoglobulins, so all the three immunoglobulins, that is the AMG, in synergy with other CSF testing parameters can help in distinguishing an important question whether the case is an autoimmune or a non-autoimmune condition. So this is how uh, these are the other, on the top uh, row, these are the other tests which are involved in the CSF routine examination. And based on these kind of reports, if you club the reports into one single format, it would probably give us a, some indication whether the case could be autoimmune or a MS or an ALD 
or basically opportunistic infection. Yeah, so that's all. Thank you. Thank you, sir. That was a very uh, informative session. I think uh, not much questions have come. One question was on uh, whether there will be a positivity of anti ganglicide antibody after giving IVIG. That was one question which I saw. I cannot see any other questions in the box now. Sorry, I could not hear you. Sorry. And anti ganglicide antibody positivity following IVIG treatment. Is there any chance for that? So, uh, ideally, though, it's not expected, but we haven't come across any clinician referring us uh, again a test for ganglioside post IVIG. So, we are not having any experience on this, but as per literature, we don't expect it to be there. So, we'll move on to the experts for that. Yeah, I had a question also about this. Um, when, you, when you have, have this IVIG being given, very often it is given before CSF or anything else has been done. How does it affect the specificity of the, I mean, is it possible that the pooled IVIG sample which you give as, as treatment may actually um, uh, con confound the results? Or you think it's... No, ideally, the specificity of the test would not be affected. The uh, will affect it would be the sensitivity part. So specificity, there will be no false positives. Or I you can see. say, yeah, it's only the sensitivity which could be affected because we are expecting the antibodies to be cleared up. Okay. Dr. Anita. Yeah, hello. Yeah, yeah, Rijit, please speak. Yeah, I also have a question to... for uh, Dr. Vidal. You mentioned this CSF IgG index, um, you know. So, what are the clinical indications for doing such a test? Apart from what you discussed, you mentioned it could be inflammatory versus uh, non inflammatory causes. So, what are the common indications do you think that a clinician should order this test for CSF IgG index? Well, currently, it's basically being referred only to see whether there is any intrathecal kind of synthesis or MS which is being there. But uh, that is the only indication right now they are using it for uh, determination. For example, many chronic infections also would give rise to that. Now, for example, uh, SSP would be, for example, one of the... Yes, for measles. Yes, just the yes. inflammatory in the CSF. That's right. Dr. Anita, Dr. Anita, yeah. uh, very much enjoyed the talk, Dr. Viral. I think it was very comprehensive. It was good that you covered the four most important questions that clinicians always ask the sample type to be tested, the testing platform, whether titles should be done or not and how to validate. I think these were very, very uh, important questions that were answered. I was just wondering how often have you seen multiple uh, parameters coming positive, particularly in paraneoplasty? That is something- Until now, that... no. no. We haven't seen multiple antibodies. Interesting. Okay. Because that's something that we have, we have been coming across quite frequently. Okay, no, but till now we haven't come across. Good for you, I guess. So the validation that you spoke about, I think, is very important. The testing it out on tissue as well as immunoblot. And the point that recovery is something that you can't pick up, you mentioned. Maybe the other thing is title, which does not have any immunofluorescence pattern. So I think the point that you made was very, very critical, that clinical information needs to be given for us to uh, yes. do a good interpretation. I really yes. enjoyed it. Yeah, even from a laboratory point of view, even if you start getting clinical information for each and every patient, probably you, we as lab also may be able to come up with certain common lab features associated with certain antibodies, which will be across all clinicians, not only with one specific clinician. So probably we could come up with that also, but yes, it is important to be shared. True. Ask something? Totally agree. Totally. Was the answer? Was the answer? Yeah, thank you, Mini. Dr. Viraj, thank you very much for your excellent presentation. I really enjoyed that. Yeah, you clearly uh, defined the guidelines for the antibody screening with respect to the disease-based. I really enjoyed that. Um, sometimes we order antibody or some test uh, using the clinical evidence of the cases, but I think we have to be uh, discussed with the lab person 
when we are ordering um, antibody or something immune testing for the kids, which uh, which uh, technology, this which methodology is the best one for this case? We have to be discussed. Could you advise to clinicians to make a good collaboration with the lab persons before sending the uh, 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 samples for the analysis? For example, and sometimes uh, we, we get a negative results at the beginning of the disease. For example, I remind that uh, MOG antibody uh, with presentation of um, what, a poor encephalopathic periods Antibody is negative, but in the in the second wave or the following of disease, we will get the positive results. I, I think we have to be uh, discussed uh, with, with great collaboration with the lab person and clinician together with the case-based case. Correct, correct. Hence, it is important to get all those details, but a lab can also sometimes come back. Okay, possibly this could be done for this case, and this could probably help out. Okay. Like example, in ganglioside testing, many clinicians just offer, uh, I mean, not offer, prescribe GM1 testing standalone. But ideally, as a laboratory, we know that there is no kit currently which tests only for GM. It's always the entire ganglioside panel which goes through. So if suppose it's been discussed then, and we have the history with something, we could also say, okay, we have been found GM1 positive, but we example found GT positive. So we could say, okay, this is correlating and hence, now let's discuss. Because similarly, there are cases like even now like bulbal palsy, which is being seen, GM3 is found to be positive in those cases. So we had one case wherein a clinician did not request for this, but when we got it positive, we discussed it with the clinician. He said, yes, very much he's a bulbal palsy case. So when we went back into the literature, there are similar reports which are there. So it's necessary for a clinician and lab to I would trust on each other and share information to discuss. Thank you. Dr. Nilu and Dr. Uh, hi, Dr. Viral. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. yes, yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you for an excellent talk. I just wanted to know when you ask for an antibody, was the cell-based assay and tissue-based assay, is it automatically decided or we have to specify? Or you on your own uh, decide which one to use in, in uh, no, what so condition basically, you are uh, doing? We are doing it only based on a clinician request, but only for NMD, whenever there is either an encephalitis panel or only a standalone NMDA, the current cell-based assay which are available in the market to us, there is a sometimes a staining issue because of other AN and also the substrate which they are using. So there is a lot of background also which we see, which may unnecessarily go as a false positive or a false negative. Unless the uh, pathologist is very experienced over a period of time, he may be able to be easily pick up. So from the day one, when we had that issue, we automatically started doing, especially for uh, an MDA, whenever it was prescribed as an individual or an entire panel, a tissue-based test. We started automatically doing only in that case. Okay. So only an MDA. such ah. kind of rule, uh, false negative or a false positive. But now with experience, okay, we know that looking at the CB also, what can be positive and what can be negative. But okay. at that time, we thought, no, that was not a correct way. Also, the company itself, or you can see that they are themselves wanting to use this because they also know that there is a lacunae in that substrate, which is there only for a cell-based assay. But it's only because of whatever the other economics come into factor, many people do not want to go into that. Okay, uh, also one more question. Uh, uh, any experience with CSF for antibody? Like there has been... We had only interest. one request till yeah. date. But after that, that was also negative only. But we haven't had any CSF mock request other than that one sample. Dr. Anita, okay. Dr. Anita what about you in your experience? Our clinicians are a little more um, uh, liberal, I think. They like to send CSF and serum for the tests. So in MOG, we have not seen that much of a concordance. Serum is more, more often positive. Uh, whereas in the uh, NMDA, we would always recommend uh, CSF and serum. So I agree with Dr. Viral. It has to be CSF and serum. But for the VGKC, serum alone. They don't very often come in CSF at all. So I, I would recommend CSF serum for NMDA. But for the others, serum is good. 
Mark does not require. We have not seen a case where uh, CSF has been positive and serum negative. We have very rarely seen that. The only time we have has been uh, following plasmapheresis, which has been given. So the CSF remained positive, whereas the serum had turned negative. So that situation we have faced, but it hasn't been common. Thank you. Naveen also has a hand raised. Dr. Yeah, partly answered by Dr. Anita. I think uh, um, we have seen patients who have been tested uh, with CSF MOG and uh, turned negative, and rather uh, were tested negative, but serum MOG was positive. So for MOG, I think serum is the sample to test. Secondly, her observation regarding uh, dual positivity. Uh, we have had at least a few patients with dual positivity, particularly NMDA with Casper, NMDA with AMPA. So um, in my little experience, I think whenever they have herpes encephalitis, uh, that is one situation where they can have more than one antigen testing positive. Oh, sorry, antibody testing positive. Dr. Udani, would you like to say with your vast experience in this subject, dual positivity? Vishrup also wants to say something. Vishrup, after Dr. Udani. No, I think uh, I absolutely agree with uh, uh, um, uh, Naveen that, uh, you, know, you know, herpes simplex encephalitis uh, followed by NMDR is something, in fact, you may have patients who are not symptomatic and may still have a, a antibody positivity. And then you have to just make sure that uh, it doesn't turn, you don't not normally treat those patients. In fact, one study, I remember it was almost... Uh, 25 to 30 percent of patients with herpes simplex encephalitis had uh, developed antibodies to their MD receptor. But I think. Yeah. No, no, sir, please complete. Okay, we should do. Yeah, I just want to, you know, comment on what uh, Udani sir and Dr. Naveen had just pointed out. Ma'am would remember, Shefali ma'am, that, you know, we also have this. We had a case of jab B, which was jab B to begin with, then, Im then improved in between, then worsened again, and actually then turned out an MDA positive. So this, you know, immediately following an infection is, is something that we had seen with jab B also, apart from herpes. The other point of dual positivity, we have seen dual positivity in a child who had this white matter lesions, external capsule involvement, and an MDA positivity. So mock positivity, as well as an MDA positivity in the same child, the child responded very well in terms of the white matter lesions, but still continues to have temporal of epilepsy. The, the acute encephalitis part is over, the NMDA positivity and the mock positivity, the acute you know, presentation, the child has come out of it, but over a prolonged period of time, now almost five, six years, the child continues to have temporal of epilepsy. So dual positivity with both white matter as well as gray matter based lesions, both antibodies, which could be you know targeted towards white matter and towards gay matter, I mean, we have also seen, ma'am would remember, Shifali ma'am would remember the case. Yeah, actually, I was going to say that only, that we have seen uh, both with herpes as well as jab B and maybe more with jab B than herpes. And I also wanted to say that you may have the relapse, you know, in NMDA uh, after a very long time uh, also, because, you know, I had a child uh, who, uh, who was really bad at the age of two, and now the child is 18, and now she's had a relapse you know so in that situation we need to have long-term follow-ups also these patients i think i'll request dr viral and dr anita to put answer the questions in the in the chat there was, there was one question on uh, the use of uh, antibody testing in cidp probably can so basically those are the newly uh observed antibodies which are currently known those are the nf 140 and especially 155 NF-155 is showing a very high prevalence in terms of all the neofacin-mediated uh, uh, CIDP cases. So this has just been uh, started and currently it's been done on the ELISA platform. Thanks. I'll request for all other questions. Please answer Dr. Viral and Dr. Anita. And uh, I'd request... Um... Mini, please go to the cases. And I request all the presenters to please, 6 plus 2. We are already running behind schedule. So 6 plus yeah, 2 and at 5, you please, at 5 minutes, you please flag it. Yeah. Okay. Dr. Sujada can first uh, present her case. I hope Dr. Kanta has joined. Yes, ma'am, I have joined. Okay. Dr. Sujada can do and then 
Dr. Aradhana followed by Dr. Kanta. Please share your screen and start presenting. So, uh, good evening, all. Uh, is the screen visible and I'm audible? Yes, Dr. Sujata, you are visible and the screen is also audible. Thank you. So, we, uh, we have an interesting uh, case from PJ today. Like, uh, he is a four year old boy, Master, Master G, residing from uh, Patiala, informants being mother and father. He, he was. Uh, presented in our ER with a history of fever for five days, seizures for two days, and altered sensorium for two days. So uh, his course of illness started with a uh, fever, which lasted for around five days. It, the fever was low grade. There were two to three spikes per day, and there was no associated symptoms to suggest any focus or a rash. And the fever used to relieve with PCM. From uh, day six of the illness, he started having multiple episodes of generalized onset tonic-clonic seizures. Uh, associated with clenching and uh, frothing, each lasting for around two to three minutes. And after the first seizure, only the child started having uh, altered sensorium in the form of excessive irritability, reduced sleep, intermittent crying. He stopped recognizing uh, his parents. There was no indication of daily needs. And parents uh, reported some intermittent darting tongue movements also. On day seven, he was brought to Aria. And there was no uh, history to suggest a cranial nerve involvement or a paucity of limb movements or evidence of uh, uh, neck stiffness based on history. And there was no history of low stools, cough, paresa, recent vaccination, dog bite or a TB contact to suggest a associated etiology pre uh, precipitating this illness. So a past and perinatal history was, uh, were uneventful. Developmentally, he was typically a developing child. He was immunized for age. And... Uh, Family history was also not contributory. On general physical examination, he was essentially normal. There was no gross dysmorphism or syndromic features. Anthropometrically, he was having an acute and chronic malnutrition with a small head with an OFC of 48 centimeters. On neurological examination, uh, he was irritable, was minimally conscious, was not oriented to his parents or surroundings. Essentially, the rest of the CNS examination was normal except for the brisk details. And meningeal signs were absent. Other system examination was also normal. So we have a four-year-old pre-morbidly normal, typically developing child who presented with a history of fever for five days, seizures for two days, and altered sensorium for two days. On examination, we found acute and chronic malnutrition, small head. He had encephalopathy, but uh, no focal deficits or no meningeal signs. So we considered uh, the possibilities of an infectious etiology fitting into an acute encephalitis syndrome, probably a viral or a bacterial encephalitis, and an immune-mediated pathology like an Adam. Uh, so uh, we went ahead with an MRI. The T1 was, uh, T1 sequence was normal. T2-weighted imaging showed uh, bilateral, symmetrical, uh, striatal hyperintensities. We couldn't find any other uh, abnormality in any other uh, areas of brain. And correspondingly, due to flare, also showed uh, similar uh, striatal hyperintensities, which were uh, symmetrical and bilateral. So uh, diffusion and ADC didn't show any evidence of uh, restriction. So we went ahead with LP, which showed uh, zero cells with uh, sugar, normal sugar and an ele mildly elevated protein of 56. Culture sensitivity was sterile. So we have a child with acute encephalitis syndrome with no focal deficits or meningeal signs, MRI brain showing bilateral symmetrical striatal hyperintensities with no diffusion restriction, and CSF, uh, which is acellular with a mildly elevated protein. So coming to the uh, etiologies, considering the given situation, so this is a, a cohort, a sub-cohort from the famous California Encephalitis Project, where they have analyzed the children uh, with thalami and basal ganglia lesions. So the causes in uh, less than 18 years old uh, cohort was found to be predominantly infectious, which includes the respiratory uh, syncytial virus, Epstein-Barr virus, West Nile, and few cases of uh, tuberculosis and HSV. And the non-infectious cohort included uh, rarely, like only few cases of neoplasm or a paraneoplastic manifestation associated with autoimmune encephalitis. So now we have a question of basal ganglia encephalitis with three possible underlying etiologies, infectious, metabolic, or immune-mediated phenomena. So 
so to uh, support infectious we have the acute encephalitis like presentation mri changes could suggest an infectious process but a lack of pleocytosis in csf goes against an infectious etiology and coming to the um, metabolic uh, conditions presenting with encephalopathy and bilateral striatal surgical hyperintensities a uh, lack of diffusion restriction a premorbidly developmentally normal child and an absent family history or a consanguinity uh, takes little away from the metabolic etiology for an immune mediated pathology everything else is suggestive csf picture is also suggestive but bilateral symmetrical striatal hyperintensities without dis diffusion restriction and without involvement of other areas uh, is little uh, under reported in even in literature and we had little experience when coming to this kind of presentation so uh, we went ahead with the uh, infectious investigations along with that uh, we sent a anti mog antibody and anti acuporin for antibody the cell based assay came strongly positive for anti mog antibodies and acuporin turned out to be negative the child was started on methylprednisolone for 5 days followed by an oral steroid taper uh, he has been followed up for the last 6 months and there were no relapses so the final diagnosis was mog associated uh, demyelination with acute on chronic malnutrition so coming to the typical mri patterns i think we had a wonderful uh, lecture so i won't be um, repeating the things which have been discussed by dr atheen sir so we have poorly demarcated lesions which are very specific uh, to suggest a demyelination and uh, usually there will be a multi regional involvement uh, when when we consider uh, mog associated demyelination so these are the typical small lesions described with mog these are the typical uh, tumor factive lesions described with mog encephalitis pattern and the leukodystrophy pattern which have been recently recognized uh, along with mog so uh, coming to the uh, differentiation between mog and acuporin for there are no much uh, lesions which uh, typically uh, differentiate uh, except yeah. for the um, topographical distribution of the lesions so we can find uh, deep gray matter lesions in essentially all the uh, demyelinating disorders and uh, even the larger cohorts reported around basal ganglia involvement in around uh ranging from 30 to uh, 60 percentage of cases but uh, a typical uh, isolated striatal involvement has not been uh, particularly described in any of the larger or the sm even smaller cohorts described in literature along with me. so coming to the other possible uh, differentials in case of uh, isolated striatal involvement we have anti uh, d2 receptor autoimmune encephalitis which has uh, typical bilateral striatal involvement and uh, we have a uh, case reports on an anti recurrent antibodies associated with a uh, similar kind of picture but these has been described more in adults as it's a paraneoplastic antibody found in adults and they typically present with cancer associated retinopathy so coming to our child uh, at admission we can see that he is uh, encephalopathic irritable on touch and he's not interacting with the surrounding other parents parents are standing nearby hmm and uh, on day 3 of uh, methylprednisolone pulse therapy he showed uh, a slight improvement he started recognizing parents however the irritability kept persisted after completing pulse at discharge the child was oriented to time place person he was interacting well so uh, coming to the take home messages like mog should be suspected in uh, relevant clinical settings even uh, there are varied mri patterns as described previously in literature and we tend to come across newer patterns like uh, this case uh, stresses on the import importance of testing mog even in isolated striatal symmetrical involvement and uh, so uh, once we suspect only we will be uh, testing and treating accordingly thank you thank you for the lecture whether mycoplasma was tested in this and also there is a comment that streptococcal as well as HHV6 and mycoplasma can be associated with the striatal involvement and I have seen a case of mums, post mums there can be uh, basal ganglia involvement and a kinetic mute child I also seen. Dr. Navi? Dr. Navi? That's true, yeah that's true uh, all these uh, viruses can directly involve the basal ganglia in a viral encephalitic panel uh, pattern, but uh, 
the point is that they can also trigger autoimmunity and cause the basal ganglia involvement so the the through sh- by sharing this case we just wanted to make a point that ogad can also cause bilateral basal ganglia involvement so even if mycoplasma had tested positive uh the course uh, suggested that the patient had mogad and encephalitis because of the very rapid recovery within days after steroids um that's all did it out whether the thalamus was also involved in this case was it there for was- yeah there was a subtle involvement of thalamus subtle involvement of the thalamus asymmetric uh, but most of the lesion were in the basal ganglia somebody has asked uh- the theta for more positivity was it had it was a cell based uh, essay no yes it was a cell based essay and uh, uh, titers were not available uh, we just saw this patient 4 weeks back we don't have the repeat imaging okay so shall we move on to the second case now dr ar no we can have we can have opinion from uh, from yes, dr arichit and dr udani uh, dr har uh, dr hasan had to leave for another meeting so dr udani and dr arichit and dr anita uh, i don't have any comments um uh, uh, this is the first sort of experience of this sort of presentation so over to the other experts uh atin and dr virar can uh, so should i make a point Yes, sir sir after you only i said they can all they can also say well, yeah, please i just yeah I, i actually present i mean uh, publish this in the indian pediatrics about i think 15 20 years ago of acute basal ganglia encephalitis it was steroid responsive at that time of course more was not been described i'm wondering how many because all of them responded beautifully to to steroids and they did show and that that is published in the indian pediatrics and that uh, and those patients probably many of them were really mock positive i think uh, obviously at that time we didn't know thanks doctor i think okay. somebody has asked uh, how frequently we have to or uh, do we have to do repeat imaging in case of mogad right ma'am so uh, uh, actually it's basically we do not do a routine follow up imaging i think at our institute also it's more based on symptom uh, or re- relapses if the patient responds then we do not do a repeat imaging to look for lesion load or silent lesions as we may call it's it's only if the symptoms relapse then we do and we have seen patients having relapse although it said that the mog lesions typically resolve well but in children there are relapses which are seen and we have our experience in children with relapses in different locations compared to the initial load but they again responded very well without any significant sequelae so if if it is clinically indicated we do image them but not on a routine follow up mishrup and navin both have their mishrup and navin both have their hands raised mishrup and navin so uh, just agreeing with dr atin uh, mogad is not a disease with radiologically isolated uh, syndrome so we only uh, repeat imaging if there is a clinical relapse dr bishuru yeah one thing that dr navin said i just wanted to say the same thing and secondly what udani sir made a point we also had you know this anti basal ganglia encephalitis which responded to steroids which had striatal involvement and this was happening around 5 6 years back there was a lab which was doing anti basal ganglia antibody and it was you know directed against the respiratory enzymes and then again this this particular concept i think has faded away with emergence of mog but then at that point of time mog was not you know available but that child turned out anti basal ganglia antibody positive which was directed against the respiratory chain enzymes uh, that particular group of antibodies if there are no more comments shall we go to the next case dr aradhna can you just share yes, the screen ma'am. and present yes ma'am uh good evening everyone uh, i'm dr aradhna from aims new delhi i'll be presenting a case on, of uh, recurrent uh, ads emphasizing on thinking beyond obvious So our child was a 16 year old boy who was under our follow up since 2018 and was being treated as a case of recurrent demyelination. 
was a case of recurrent acquired demyelination syndrome with presentation of recurrent optic neuritis. His initial neuroimaging had shown a lesion in the left uh, thalamus along with right optic neuritis, but later uh, imaging had suggested left followed by bilateral optic neuritis. And his OCB was positive and MOG and aquaporin 4 levels were negative. Ma his, he had had multiple relapses and was being treated on the lines of pediatric cognitive MS with oral and pulse steroids, azathioprine, and rituximab, and was in remission for the last two years. Then in November 2022, he presented to an outside hospital with complaints of fever and headache for a month. He also had decreased speech out output for 15 days and right upper and lower limb weakness with facial deviation for uh, one week. At that time, uh, on examination, he had right facial human palsy and right hemiparesis. So outside, he was treated for hyponatremia. And based on the clinical findings and the repeat imaging characteristics, they had uh, considered a possibility of a relapse. And uh, they had planned to start pulse steroids for the child. However, since they were uh, a follow-up at AIMS, so they wanted to shift to AIMS. So uh, uh, parents pre then presented to AIMS. At AIMS, when we reviewed the imaging of the child, the uh, imaging uh, showed uh, right uh, ring-enhancing lesions in the left basal ganglia and the internal capsule region on uh, T1 contrast-weighted images. As, uh, and uh, on T2 images, uh, uh, there, was a uh, uh, there was a heterogeneous iso-intense lesion. So since the lesions were typically involving the gray matter and also they were not the characteristic uh, open ring enhance, uh, uh, ring of enhancement uh, type picture, but there was a complete thick ring, ring of enhancement. And on T2 also, there was a heterogeneous ISO intensity. So a uh, possibility of an infectious etiology was more likely. And also the child had a, uh, an immunocompromised status and there was a preceding history of fever. So we considered the possibility of a fungal abscess and other possibilities uh, like a parasitic infection, toxoplasmosis, tubicular abscess, and partially treated bacterial abscess were also considered. So we went ahead with other blood and uh, CSF investigations. The child had a no normal counts. Uh, his CRP and Procal levels were normal. On CSF examination, he had no cells. Sugar and proteins were normal. But CSF pan fungal PCR was positive. Uh, however, CSF cryptococcus and galactomannin were negative, acanthamoeba and uh, TB workup was also negative. So uh, based on the diagnosis of a fungal abscess, we continued treatment. Uh, so initially, the child was on meropenem and vancomycin. After these results, we discontinued the same. And we continued the child on boriconazole and liposomal amphotericin B for four weeks. And after that, it, he was switched over to oral boriconazole for next two weeks. Uh, at the same time, stress dose of oral steroids was continued and other immunosuppressive uh, agents were withheld. So this is the serial neuroimaging uh, of the child one month after uh, antibiotics. So there is significant resolution of the lesions can be seen. So when we reviewed literature, we found that uh, overall the background uh, rate of uh, infection in children with the MS is around 0. 0.2 to 2.6%. And the risk of invasive fungal infection as being opportunistic treatment uh, related complication in this population is although low, but still it is quite frequent with monoclonal antibodies and fingolimod. And aspergillus and cryptococcal meningitis were the most representative uh, fungal infections. Also, another study had pointed out that among the various uh, agents used, uh, rituximab had the highest uh, uh, adjusted uh, rate of infections. This is uh, a table uh, showing the garden variety of infections, which can be seen with the use of these various agents. Then subsequently, uh, in Jan 2023, that was uh, around one and a half months after this event, the child again presented to us with pain in bilateral lower limbs for a week, with a history of frequent falls while walking for one week. So he was now walking with assistance and was having difficulty in getting up from sipping to standing position. Uh, at this time on examination, the child predominantly had proximal muscle weakness with the uh, shoulder and uh, hip uh, power of around 4 by 5. And he also had uh, hyperreflexia. Uh, tone was normal. Uh, the sens uh, sensory system was intact and there were no cranial nerve deficits. So in uh, view of uh, reduced immunosuppression for the past one and a half months, we considered a possibility of a relapse of MS. And we also considered uh, maybe there was progression of a fungal abscess. So we went ahead with blood investigations and repeat neuroimaging. And at the same time, we also started the child on IVIG in possibility of a relapse. During those investigations, we found that the potassium level is 1.7. So at that time, we also concurrently started uh, with hypokalemia correction. Uh, 
However, the repeat neuroimaging that was done, it showed complete almost complete resolution of the fungal lesions. And also there were no new lesions for uh, suggestive of a relapse. So a final diagnosis that we made at this, uh, at this point was that of hypokalemic paralysis, secondary to voriconazole induced tubulopathy. We continued potassium correction and along with ECG monitoring and the child uh, 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 child's weakness improved uh, over, uh, over the next uh, few days. Uh, post discharge, we continued the child on uh, potassium supplements and also we stopped voriconazole in view of uh, clinical and radiological uh, resolution. When we reviewed literature, we found that uh, although uh, as compared to amphotericin B, the prevalence of voriconazole induced hypokalemia is lower, but still... Uh, like 2.4 percent can still have a potassium level below uh, 2.5 and there are case reports of oriconazole induced severe hypokalemic rhabdomyolysis as well uh, currently our child is doing fine and is uh, now uh, has now uh, not had any remission for the uh, has uh, been in remission for the past uh, four years and is ambulatory so to conclude, I, will, I would like to summarize that uh, when treating a chronic immune uh, mediated disorders, the child will be presenting with intermittent new onset focal deficits, but every time they will not be relapses. We should always keep in mind other possibilities like treatment related opportunity, uh, opportunistic infections, metabolic complications and multiple drug interactions. Thank you. Thank you. That was a very uh, good case with a lot of learning points. Dr. Vishudu? Radna, stop sharing the screen. Nothing much to add. I think Dr. Radhana presented well. So the main, you know, learning message from this case was that every time a child with a chronic immune-mediated disorder comes to you with new onset focal deficits, just don't think about it as, you know, some relapse which has happened of the primary disease. It could be something related to the treatment that is going on. And so this was the only thing that we wanted to highlight, that it's not just the primary disease. We need to think about the secondary complications as well as the drug interactions and drug-related complications which can happen in these children with chronic disorders. That's it. Thank you, Dr. Mini. Thank you. Dr. Shefali, shall we go to the last case? Yeah, we can just ask Arijit, Atin, uh, Viral, and Dr. Anita. Anybody wants to say something? Dr. Yeah, I think it was me? very well presented uh, case, a uh, complicated case. And I think... Uh, uh, Bishurut summed it up very well, so nothing extra to add. Thank you. We can go to the next one. Yeah. Last, last presenter, Dr. Kanta Kumar. Yes, ma'am. Asmita, you've not shared Aradhana's certificate. You can do that in the end, it's okay. Yes, <laughs> Had illness started as a fever, it was low weight and it had it was persistent for the next two days. On day two of present illness, the child had right focal seizure and the child was admitted uh, in a nearby hospital. And the child was called to blood pressure. And uh, on day three of illness, the child started having water injury. Initially, the child was drowsy, was confused, had irritable on talks, and she had one episode of left focal seizure. For that, the child was started with the and meanwhile, in outside hospital, they have another type of prospective antibiotics, like subscribes on macrovision, optimism, combination therapy, and doxycycline, and anti lysis is measured for also treatment. Uh, gradually, the altered sensory was as progress. The child became unresponsive on the next day, with the eye opening and motor activity only to painful stimulus. And the child subsequently developed blood focal status of the fetus. For this, the child was started on the sodium oxide and mirror substitution. The child was intubated, started on mechanical ventilation. The child presented to us on day three of illness. So, at the time of presentation or progress neurological examination, the child was deeply encephalopathic with pulse score of E1, M2, E4, and R1. Pupils were reacting to the On conduct examination, the child had made to this case more. Based on reflexes were excitable, there was no television or problems, and there was no major change. So, our working diagnosis was active febrile encephalopathy with focal status of the fetus with right injury. 
Our ancient possibilities are hyperbaric encephalitis, any bacterial or tropical encephalitis, autoimmune encephalitis, or encephalopathy with uh, inflammation, including uh, Hadam, Fonger, uh, and NMOSP, or intoxication. And when we are the CSL, this was done also with the CSL with the elevated proteins. So if I continue to carry on mechanical uh, uh, manipulation, appropriate antibiotic sensing dimensions were continued, and the uh, ASM which are started from the outside after this were also continued. And we have uh, done a CE MRI within two hours of presentation. So uh, these are the TV one the in this. In this, we can see bilateral asymmetric hyperintensities, predominantly involving the cortical gray matter, with the uh, involvement of Pichula and Pedopti Kodai. And there are few copia of diffusion description in the involvements. Interestingly, we have also noticed that uh, there are subtle hyperintensity involving the anterior segment of. Uh, Optic nerve bilaterally, which are turning force from the penile muscle. So, uh, with the involvement of an anterior segment of optic nerve, optic neuritis with encephalitis like presentation, it had a strong possibility of uh, demyelinating disorders, especially in mobile. And within four hours of presentation, the diary of total of methylprednisone pulse therapy under antibiotic cover. Based on investigation, studied the neurotrophic. Uh, Logocytosis, which was lymphocyte development with mild transamitis with elevated inflammatory markers. Methyl production on pulse therapy was continued. She had multiple episodes of seizure during the course of illness, which are controlled with Midas infusion and other anti seizure medications. Despite having the institution of any similar therapy, which was started within four hours of presentation and an appropriate anti rice ICT measures, the time reiterated and second on day two of presentation. So after the three days of therapy, we got the mob report, uh, which was strongly positive. So let me move on to my second case. We had a four-year-old boy with smooth perinatal transition with normal development, present with fever for three days, four days back, water syndrome for two days, and abnormal body for one day. So fever was associated with your day, and the was asymptomatic for the next two days. On day six of illness, the sanitary normal project syndrome, insulin was irritable. With sleep disturbances followed by progressive de uh, decreased responsiveness. We have multiple episodes of the problem of synthesis that evolved into focal clear disappointments during the time of presentation. And there was a more history of any uh, dystonia, no history of unknown uh, terminate, I mean, angle by insect by trauma, or back vaccine and dying water illnesses. Processity and family is provided and not continuously. So, coming to the post of illness, during the presentation, the side of the was in the left focal status of epilepticus. Finally, he was subdued with sinus fatigue and stereo hypertension. Anti seizure medication was started. Medical examination showed encephalopathy with ongoing left focal giving seizures. Trauma increased in uh, bilateral low regions and DTS were hyperreflexic with directly parallel in uh, both types. So, the time was started on uh, antibiotics, which are very specific measures, and we have modified with MRI. In the MRI, uh, these are the video and the uh, flag sequences, which show almost near symmetrical involvement. Hydrogenopsity is involving the uh, optical and subcortical areas, predominantly in the parietal occipital region and temporal area. Insular is involved, parietal uh, lymphoma uh, nucleus, and bilateral nervous is also involved. You can also see most of these involved areas are showing diffusion restriction. And uh, uh, in this image, you can uh, use the axial fat surface uh, image, which is showing prominent optic nerve end, which is causing the flattening of nerve also. So, this plant also had a optic neuritis like presentation. So, warm up kept us a strong possibility and the time was better than metal building several points. And uh, investigation panel of this type of user with uh, uh, leukocytic leukocytosis and related inflammatory markers. Prednisolone uh, metal prednisolone was continued, but however, the next 36 hours the time deteriorated and second to death. And uh, in this trial also, we got strong positive mob antibodies. So, uh, coming to the literature review, uh, like in more patients, adamic presentation, optic neuritis, and cancerous myelitis are more common. But sometimes there are some bad presentations, including encephalitis, like neurotherapy, involving the gray matter, leukodystrophic like factor, or allergy syndromes, which are quite rare. So this is a large cohort uh, which was published in Lancet. In this, uh, they have done a uh, uh, demonization panel in uh, 296 encephalitis patient, but only several patients had more antibody, more positive. So optical neuromatic involvement is quite higher than more, and among them, only 14 percent had status epilepticus. So status epilepticus like presentation is also quite higher in uh, more associated disease. 
and they have also uh, delineated the phenotypes with polar spectrum. So those patients, those polar patients who had diffuse cortical involvement and ended up with like presentation had polar outcomes, and even more uh, local dystrophy like that had polar outcomes. So we have uh, regular literature to know what is the percentage of mortality in more patients. This is a power of 15 patients. And in this, there was only one patient with mortality who, who had raised an encephalitis. This is an another uh, paper which was published. And uh, in this, uh, there was about 84 patients. In this, there was no mortality. So in this, they had objective work to calculate the mortality rate. But in this study, there was no mortality. So they have uh, taken the previous studies and they have just calculated the upper limit of 9 to 12 percent confidence interval of low mortality rate, which was 2.1%. So learning points from our two cases are. Good evening, everyone. So we wanted to uh, share these cases because we used to think that MOG is a very good prognostic. Like we, uh, we as soon as we give treatment, we give we get results. But we see these two. We saw these two kids have a severe presentation, and we suspected early. We gave treatment early, but despite that, the child, the, these two children, has relentless progressive course and they succumbed. So there was a learning that uh, they can, uh, if like they can die, there might be need of any extra immunotherapy also if we have this type of presentation. And uh, uh, one doubt which we I can I also want to ask to uh, Anita ma'am that like uh, when we have, I was discussing these cases with uh, some of our some of my colleagues, they told that this uh, positivity can be false positive also. That so but. That I that I want to ask, ma'am, um, is that strongly positive MOG antibodies with this type of presentation, like what are the chances this is this can be false positive? Uh, good question. Uh, see, any immunofluorescence test is subject to interpretation, but the false positivity usually we see only when it's a very weak pattern of staining. And that might be mis that might mislead us to say it's positive. When it's strongly positive, it is. I wouldn't think it's a false positive. The second thing that we have noticed is a pattern to that MOG when we look at immunofluorescence. It's not been described, of course, but uh, we have found two distinct patterns. Uh, one is a cytoplasmic, the other is membranous. And the cytoplasmic, when it is there, we are very certain that it is. It correlates very well with the clinical. So. Uh, a third thing I want to say, when we say strongly positive, um, we are not, you cannot directly correlate it with titer. You still need to do an ELISA for an exact titer. Okay, so bottom line, strong positive, not a false positive. I don't know if Dr. Vidal wants to come in. Dr. Vidal, you want to say something? And Sangeeta, you wanted to make some comment too after Dr. Viran. Dr. Mini, you are muted. Uh, Dr. Sangeeta has commented that it looks like flames, and Dr. Kalpana also has commented that it looks like Mogad. Yes, Dr. sir. Dr. Sangeeta and Dr. Yeah, Kalpana, do you want to add? Ma'am, I want to make a comment. Yeah. So, flames uh, like usually have a biphasic kind of presentation and focal, usually focal. But this child has a diffuse involvement in uh, you know, neuroimaging, you can see. And uh, status was focal, but uh, changes are everywhere. So maybe it is like extension of that flames, and it will get a new name in future. 
like flames. Sangeeta, you want to add anything onto it? Sangeeta? No, ma'am. No, ma'am. No, ma I just wanted Atinsa's opinion whether it can be called as a flames based on the clinical as well as radiological findings. Uh, uh, sorry, can 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 we just go back to the image again? I I maybe want to have a closer look again. If if it can be shared. Sir. Yes, sir. I don't know. Yes, yes, it's yeah. actually it's flames is also one just pattern which has been described. It is difficult to make a diagnosis based on that only for baguette, and it as as has been told, it clearly mimics. It's difficult to uh have was contrast done here. No next next image. Yeah, so we also would require even leptomeningeal enhancement to be shown to be slightly more specific. This is actually a non-specific pattern only. Could be like flames, but we are not sure about this. Any encephalitis can actually have this type of a picture. So just encephalitis to differentiate from a MOG encephalitis, these are not enough. But yes, anterior papillitis is something which has been shown here. And the clinical combination together would we can suggest because this is one pattern which is definitely described in MOG. We know. And especially if we give contrast and we show leptomeningeal enhancement also, that's also helpful in showing this. So uh, this is the pattern which helped us actually. And that is why we have sent MOG and started immunotherapy. And we got this report post-mortem for both the kids. So that is the like we, early suspicion we based on just this finding only. Yes, right. Alpna Vijay, you wanted yes. to say something, and Pranjit has asked for KD versus KD trial. Yes, 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 ma'am, yes, ma'am. Because we were obviously hundred, not hundred percent sure that this is that we have covered with everything and also given pulse. Okay, Kalpana. Actually, we used to give more aggressive immunotherapy like plasmapheresis, IV, IVIG and sometimes we will start like tocilizumab or rituximab like that and uh, results we usually get a little more early earlier also maybe but even otherwise the basal ganglia involvement and other white matter lesions along with that we had the cortical lesions with a similar pattern and the papillitis so all these findings are pointing towards MOGAD actually Thank you. Okay. Bishuru has something to say, I think. That should be the last. Yeah, just a small point. Lokesh, the radiological findings could also fit into alert. So can it be, you know, extension of MOGAD into an alert-like presentation? Acute leukoencephalopathy with restricted diffusion. Yes, sir. So one of the kids doesn't have diffusion restriction. Other one had. Okay, 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 okay. okay. That That is not like, just white matter was not, only the, it is... It is everywhere. It is gray matter. Both gray and white. Both gray and white. Yeah. Not like just with what we see in alerts. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Do you want to add anything? You're suggesting whether ketogenic diet was tried for this case? From this trial, the both the kids uh, have succumbed within two days. Okay. Lokesh, you're mute. You're mute. From both these kids succumbed very early, ma'am. Uh, I I think uh, like we we would have tried if we are like we have got some more time in these two kids. Thanks. Then I think at the end I would request all the speakers to give one take home message. Take home message. Uh, Dr. Arichit wants to say something. Then take home message from Atin Viral, Dr. Anita, yeah, Dr. Arichit and Dr. Arichit. Yeah. No, so uh, I mean, it was a lot of uh, learning, learning experience, new messages that were given across. And as we can understand that the whole spectrum of uh, demyelinating disorders is ever expanding, as we can see, there are so many new presentations, both radiological uh, from the lab, as well as clinical, as we are seeing in the case presentations. Those are my comments. Thanks, Dr. Atin, take home message, then Dr. Viral, Dr. Anita, Dr. Mini. My take-home message from this is, uh, as we have seen, there are so varied even imaging manifestations which are differentials. A very strong clinical radiological correlation is required. If you just, which happens in some institutes, if you just send the form, writing query this, the radiologist reports based on what he feels are right or not. 
it is best to actually discuss with the radiologist what is the specific question in mind, what are we trying to differentiate, what are we trying to look for. The radiologist can give answers exactly on those lines and the differentials can be given and then the workup can be done. So my, my take home point from this is, yes, we've all covered the demyelinating disorders, but they are best interpreted, even the imaging, however specific it may seem, is best interpreted with the right clinical correlation. And that's what we follow at our institute. And I, I can give diagnosis only because I have the right clinical input and the right clinical questions which are asked to me. Thank you, Dr. Viral. to be there. Anita? I think I can't agree with uh, Dr. Atin more than this. It, without a clinical um, information, pathology tests also are very, very difficult to interpret in isolation. So I think the point that there has to be a clinical radiopath discussion is very, very crucial. And I thank you for the invitation. I really, really enjoyed the talks and the sessions and very interesting in learning cases. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We loved your thing, I think yeah. An autopsy could have been done in that case. Maybe it could have given us a lot of answers. So do keep autopsies also in mind. They are great yeah. learning cases. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Mini. Nothing more from my side. Dr. Naveen, Dr. Bishwaroop, Mahesh. Nothing to add, ma'am. Thank you. Bishwaroop, Mahesh, Sangeeta. Nothing from my side as well, ma'am. Nothing to add. Thank you so much. Mahesh. It was a very comprehensive question, ma'am, covering all aspects. Well discussed. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, before we end, uh, Asmita, we can just share the screen. Actually, besides uh, being the AOC and current president. Uh, I'm also convener of the IEN subsection of the pediatrics and we are having a neuroimmunology uh, meet by done by Naveen Sankhyan at PGI. So can you just share and then Naveen, you can um, tell about it, a neuroimmunology update in the end of March under the IEN pediatrics subsection, please. Naveen. Thank you, ma'am. So I just want to invite all the participants uh, to our pediatric neuroimmunology update, which will be on March 29th and 30th at PGI Chandigarh. And we have international experts on neuroimmunology uh, who will be deliberating on all the hot topics in neuroimmunology. Uh, you can submit cases, abstracts, uh, and there are uh, these, uh, these cases will be discussed during the main conference. And other details can be found on this uh, website. So all details are updated on the website. So uh, please uh, visit the website and uh, join us at uh, PGI. Thank you. Thank you, Naveen. Thank you, everyone, for having joined. I think now we wind up uh, and uh, join us next week. Anybody who wants to send cases, please contact us. You can mail us and uh, uh, you'll be at AOC in India at the rate gmail.com and your cases can be presented. Thank you, Mahesh. Thank you. Thank you, Mini, for moderating it. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank all you, the experts. And thank, thank you, all you. the experts, all the case presenters, everything. It was amazing. Thank you so much.